Every morning at the Fed, he was greeted with dread. He stood six foot seven to the top of his head. Green book in his hand and cigar in his teeth. Everybody knew you didn't give no grief to Tall Paul. Tall Paul. To bring prices under control, Volcker, never without a cigar, choked off the money supply, driving up interest rates to discourage lending and borrowing. Everybody's complaining about the business today. Okay, it's rough. But what are they doing about it? I mean for the customer. After all, he's spending the money. Well, this is a Sunoco tire store, and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do about it. Mike, I'm going to do a lot more than those other tire stores who just sell you tires and never see you again. The steel belted radial is at the top of my line. They're expensive. But when I recommend them to a customer, he knows he needs them. Um, we've been frozen in with a figure that was set in 1973, and we haven't been allowed to increase our profits any. And in the past five years, the cost of operating one of these places has more than doubled, and most of us are taking home less pay than we took home in 1974. Governor Hugh Carey of New York told Congress today that default by New York City would be an economic Pearl Harbor for the rest of the nation. West German Chancellor Schmidt came here and said the collapse of the world's financial capital could push the whole world back into recession. So he tried a different tack, persuading them to focus on controlling the money supply. It was a sleight of hand, because the two are essentially the same. But it was a politically palatable tactic, and it worked. And when he slowed the money growth rate, predictively, the interest rate went way up. Neither he, nor I, nor anyone else had any idea of how high the interest rate was going to be. 8% to 9% to 10%. 15%, 18 19 20%. 21%. Volcker. Absolutely. Volcker told him, Mr. President, you've tried everything to deal with inflation. Nothing's worked. I'm going to squeeze it out of the economy the hard way through high interest rates, which he never complained about during the election. In a few days, the Congress will stand at the fork of two roads. One road is all too familiar to us. It leads ultimately to higher taxes. The other road promises to renew the American spirit. It's a road of hope and opportunity. It places the direction of your life back in your hands where it belongs. You know, probably after the Great Depression, after World War II, people realized that uh, market forces need to be uh, strongly regulated. And then starting in the 70s and the 80s with the Reagan and Thatcher revolution, and even more so after the fall of the Soviet Union, we entered in the 1990s and 2000s in a new cycle of sometimes unlimited faith in the self-regulation. Of markets. By 1937, Roosevelt had raised the highest marginal income tax rate from 63% to 79%. That went on until 1945. Now think of this today, people. The highest marginal income tax rate was 94% in 1945. If you earned a buck, God bless you, you were allowed to keep six cents of it. I don't have no part of this. Yes. The New Citizens Committee won't stand for no. Fresh air, but it quickly devolved again. There, after Kennedy, there, there was what we called the Four Stooges, uh, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter, which was the largest assemblage of bipartisan ignorance probably ever put on planet Earth. <laughs> let, let me take an honesty. From 1932, now I'm just going to talk the personal income tax. From 1932 until 1981, the highest income, never, highest income tax rate never went below 63%. Most of the time, it was in the 90s. Can you believe that?
No, I think what's happened really is that people are trained to assume that there is a, a, a f source of money in, in Washington, D.C. that oh. needs only to be turned on in order to cause hospitals to materialize. <laughs> well, I, I think, as, as this gentleman said, you're turning the clock back and you're, and you're reaching a position which is not acceptable in our society and therefore I don't really think is helpful in solving the tax problems we do have. No. Oh. Oh, this has, this has simply has to do with the recovery of a philosophical insight, one of which, uh, it strikes me as basic, is that people ought not to be singled out as a class to be penalized uh, as a result of the fact that they, they want to work harder or, or, or that their work is put a, a higher premium on by society. Or inherited more. Or inherited more. When Jimmy Carter was the Democratic president in the late 1970s, he struggled with a large federal budget deficit. The red bars in this graph show the size of the deficit each year as a percent of our total economic output, with 2% as a target to try to stay under. By 1980, the deficit remained over target. Presidential candidate Reagan could not resist scolding Carter over his poor control of the federal budget. In 1981, his first year in office, Reagan gave us the first big dose of supply-side tax cuts. He cut the top tax rate from 70 to 50 percent, cut the capital gains tax from 28 to 20 percent, reduced inheritance taxes, and lowered business taxes. True to form, these tax cuts were concentrated in the upper tier, among the job creators of corporate America. The first visible impact of the tax cuts was, disappointingly, a huge loss of government revenue and an immediate spike in the federal deficit, which skyrocketed, quickly topped out at nearly $200 billion and remained unacceptably high throughout Reagan's term. Tax cuts for corporations and the rich create more and better jobs. Wrong. Corporations used Trump's giant tax cut to buy back shares of their own stock and boost share prices. From 2017 to 2018, stock buybacks increased by a staggering 50%. Lowe's spent $10 billion on stock buybacks in 2018 and then fired thousands of workers with no notice or severance. Walmart and AT&T also laid off thousands of workers. In 1980, the top 1% of Americans earned wages of about $110,000 a year. By 1990, after about 10 years of Reaganomics, boing, the top 1% had seen their wages rise by 80%. Trickle-down economics, though, right? What's good for the rich is good for all of us, right? Not quite. Here's the average wages of the rest of the country in 1980, and here's what happened for the rest of the country after about 10 years of Reaganomics. Flat. A whopping 3% rise in wages in 10 years. The Downtown Chicago was getting ready for the Christmas shopping season, but the merchants in one neighborhood, Inglewood, expect little Christmas business this year. Most of their customers are on public aid, which has been cut by the Reagan administration. At Judge Barber's furniture store, pre-Christmas sales have not attracted shoppers and Barber blames Reaganomics. The customers that are coming in are certainly less than those that were coming in before the economics of Mr. Reagan's took place. But Drawing support from demonstrators outside but not from votes on the floor, Senate Democrats today lost an attempt to save the Social Security minimum retirement benefit. Even so, the issue is far from dead, as Phil Jones reports. As all the voting was occurring today, senior citizens were gathering on the Capitol steps to protest Social Security cuts. But the protest had no effect on the Senate, which rejected by a vote of 52 to 46 an attempt to preserve the $122 a month minimum benefit, a benefit that President Reagan has suggested for elimination. A short time later, over in the House, the same issue. What about those three million who will be affected by elimination of the minimum benefits? Among these are some of the oldest and the poorest in our society. They have nobody to protect them except the members of this Congress. Was he got 11 tax brackets, brought them down to two, lowered the rates on the highest, raised the rates on the lowest. Have you ever heard of a, of a president and a bill passing that actually raises tax rates on the lowest income earners? Can, can you imagine that? He did that, I mean, it's just amazing. Second thing. Well, it reminds me of Jane Austen, to be honest. 
Mr. Darcy. <coughs> Mr. Darcy. The author of Ecclesiastes wrote, The poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. But that was before television, which can let anybody be heard. Here is our Sunday morning cover story. I have the high privilege and the distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Miguel Cruz and his family were at home last week when President Reagan, in his televised speech on the economy, proposed 83 major program cuts. It was another blow to the South Bronx. And I'm asking that you join me in reducing direct federal spending by $41.4 billion in fiscal year 1982. Miguel Cruz is trying to support his wife and four sons on the $800 a month he earns as a metal polisher. He took the president's speech personally. In the sense that he's talking in general about the United States. And this is just a, a, for, a forgotten city, a forgotten border, the South Bronx. And I think he got the eyes mainly in the whole country, but not just in a specific state or whatever. You think this area needs special help? Yes, I do. This got to be treated as uh, an emergency. This steel mill on the outskirts of Braddock, Pennsylvania, is all that's left in a river valley that once hummed with the sounds of metal and money being made. Steel meant everything to the area. It meant uh, jobs, it meant a source of pride. For a century, the Pittsburgh area was the steel capital of the world, until the 1980s, when foreign competitors came up with revolutionary innovations and America's steel industry went bust. This plant used to employ 2,500 people. What happened here in 1984 happened all across Pennsylvania's Monongahela Valley, leaving once thriving communities like Braddock clinging to life and worrying now the next closure could mean death. This is the second Pittsburgh right here. Ray Henderson lost his job when his mill closed, but that was only the beginning. There were so many small plants that was connected to the steel industry. They went down also. And when the jobs disappeared, the shops, the banks, the people disappeared too. Economics the Laffer Curve. This concept is named after the man who developed it, Arthur Laffer. The Laffer Curve illustrates the two most important things we need to know about taxes. How much money the government can raise from taxes and at what level of taxation the government might start getting less, not more revenue. The Laffer Curve is illustrated here by a two-dimensional graph. The key point is that if you do the math, the results imply that the hump on the Laffer curve occurs where the tax rate is around 33%, much lower than economists previously thought. Let's now put these findings into political terms. They suggest that no matter what your politics, you should not want tax rates to be above 33%. The reason is that, as the Romer and Romer study suggests, when tax rates go higher than that, the government actually gets less money. Everyone of every political persuasion should pay attention to the Romer and Romer study and its important implications. The special interests are, of course, the trade unions, the monopolistic craft trade unions in particular. The do-gooders believe that by passing a law saying that nobody shall get less than two dollars an hour or two fifty an hour or whatever the minimum wage is you are helping poor people who need the money you are doing nothing of the kind what you are doing is to assure that people whose skills are not sufficient to justify that kind of a wage will be unemployed you know so the it's people the earning minimum wage are earning less than they would have forty years ago oh, much less much than, than less they would have in terms of buying power and you also say that right. that they're actually subsidizing employers stockholders and consumers explain that well, they are, because basically you are working and you are creating value for the company. 
for the shareholder, whatever. And a much bigger portion of that is going to the very top of the corporation, say the top five executives, uh, to the owners, to the shareholders, and it is not being in any way fairly shared, shared with workers. More than 80,000 Iowans now are out of work, the most in 40 years. The Democrats have endorsed a $12 billion jobs program with promises not to raise interest rates if that puts people out of work. The Republicans take a different route, calling for massive tax breaks to spur business. There are 17 United States Steel uh, Company plants closing in this country. We once produced 49% or 47% of the steel in the world. We now produce 19%. Last winter, the U.S. Steel Corporation shut down this mill in Youngstown, Ohio. They said it wasn't profitable. Today, some of the workers from the Ohio mill are trying to buy the plant and run it themselves. They are particularly bitter because they say they gave up some of their pay and then broke production records on a promise from U.S. Steel to keep the plant running as long as it made money. Likes bought Sheet and Tube in 1969, and that purchase marked the first time that industrial decisions would be made outside of the city. Likes decided to move Sheet and Tube's headquarters from the Campbell Works to Indiana in 1977. The Campbell Works was shut down on Black Monday, and it was a traumatic time for the city. 5,000 workers lost their jobs, and the loss of the Campbell Works started a chain reaction of mill closures leading up to 1985. Uh, U.S. Steel uh, decided to close its main steel plants in Youngstown, Ohio. It was a steel town, like other working class towns like Detroit. It had actually been built by the working classes. It was their town. They didn't get the profit because they were tools, but uh, they built it. They wanted to keep it. Uh, U.S. Steel wanted to sell it, to, to close it down, and the union offered to buy it. He said he was in favor of community ownership of the mills, but against massive federal bailouts. If this is in reality government ownership, then I think we're going in the wrong way because I don't think government can do anything that is not a proper function as well or as efficiently as the private enterprise sector can do. Well, if, uh, if we're producing less steel, than we were 10 years ago, uh, but uh, still have relatively full employment, mightn't it be that it, it, it's a misallocation of American energy to produce as much steel, that, that we are more efficiently producing other things? How do you handle that argument? There's no reason, there's no reason, there, there's no divine ordinance <clears throat> that requires that we produce 50% of the world's steel if, let's say, we can produce 90% of the world's plastic uh, more efficiently. We invented the assembly line and mass production, but punitive tax policies and excessive and unnecessary regulations, plus government borrowing, have stifled our ability to update plant and equipment. U.S. Steel has shut some 14 plants in the country, blaming the recession, foreign imports, and poor profits. Critics say the industry's plight is at least partially self-induced. It never reinvested in new technology and now may license it from Japan. Big Steel's liquidation, and they talk about the fact that from the point of view of the money managers at, at U.S. Steel, they'd rather be in petrochemicals, they'd rather be in fertilizers, they might rather be in banking, because steel may be profitable, but it isn't profitable enough. And so what they do, in fact in business schools they teach the new managers how to acquire what they call, literally, this is the term they use in business school, how do they acquire cash cows? Milk them dry and then move on. When workers decide to try to take over an enterprise, maybe, an enterprise which may be perfectly profitable, but not profitable enough for the multinational who, you know, who runs it, maybe they don't want to keep it in their books. When they try to buy it, which would be a good deal for the multinational, they refuse to sell it for class reasons. They have class interests. They do not want to see the spread of uh, popular democratic organizations for perfectly obvious reasons. But going back to Youngstown, uh, the case went to court in 1977. Uh, the 
union, union lost, the workers lost, and it was the steel mills were destroyed. Uh, but they didn't give up. They didn't just say, okay, we'll starve to death or go somewhere else. Uh, they began to organize small worker-owned enterprises. And they've been spreading around uh, the Cleveland area, and good Youngstown, good bit of northern Ohio, into other areas. So it is taking place. But, you know, it's, it's happening elsewhere, too. In northern Mexico, there are quite successful worker-owned plants. Uh, it, it's not easy because, you know, the, 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 the banks don't like to give them capital. Black Monday was really the beginning of the end of the basic steel industry here in the Mahoning Valley. And over the next three and a half years, the whole process just continued like a snowball going down the hill. And we lost the Briar Hill Works on the northwest side of Youngstown. U.S. Steel closed the Ohio Works and the McDonald Works. But cuts will come across the board. 650 hourly workers and 60 salaried employees were told not to come back to work after February 1st. That's the entire night production shift. They joined 349 others who got the same word months ago. What is the Rust Belt? Let's clarify. The Rust Belt is a region that goes from central New York State to Wisconsin. The Rust Belt used to have most of the factories that produced steel and made cars in the U.S. Those factories were there because the Rust Belt is near the Great Lakes. But things changed and there was less and less work for those factories in the Rust Belt. In many places, companies decided to produce things in other countries because it was easier and cheaper than doing it in the United States. General Motors confirmed it today. It is going to close plants employing almost 30,000 workers. Today, we are announcing the closing of 11 of our older plants. While Detroit and Pontiac will certainly be hurt by the shutdowns, the effect on Flint is absolutely devastating. To start with, the whole struggle for tax reform in our country is a kind of drama with good guys and bad guys and even a damsel in distress. But like all dramas, it occurs within a certain context. And here's ours. Our economy, the American economy, has never been stronger, never been bigger, and never been better. Since the economic recovery began, we've created over 8 million new jobs. What happened with the auto plant shutting down was a tragedy to this community, especially Pontiac, where I live. Um, my city is just about gone now. And this was the major staple. I don't know where the people went. I know they're not here, and I know the businesses aren't here anymore, and it's terrible. When GM left, they, everything left with it. Everything. Dreams, people, jobs. They closed several plants in the Pontiac area and it started to start the economy. The tax base, our property values are going down to that plant. You know, Detroit just it kind of stopped being the motor city. Everything snowballed at, at that moment. Uh, the effects of the air, uh, oil embargo, the rise of the Japanese, uh, the in-your-face reminder that uh, this trio of U.S. companies uh, was not necessarily going to be unthreatened for, for the rest of time. Throughout the 1980s, General Motors then, under the stewardship of its then CEO, Roger Smith, started mothballing 11 plants and laying off 30,000 workers. The consequences to this city, which once had a population of over 200,000, it is now under 100,000, were devastating. With the Saturn concept, as I've seen, General Motors is heading into the future, not just with an idea of survival, but with an idea of triumph.
the best part, this is really important, we're doing it together, both management and UAW working together. And I want to align this. We're doing it the American way. I never say the word Saturn without saying team. To me, it's kind of like bread and butter. Everything that goes together is Saturn and team. Built in their own dedicated factory and have their own separate dealer network. Even the labor agreement with the UAW was unique, with profit sharing, workers' rights, and job descriptions differing from existing agreements with GM. A lot of the managers coming up through the organization were trying to get money for their plant. And they couldn't because they put money down here at Saturn. And I think that gave us uh, the impression throughout the organization that maybe we're prima donnas down here, that, that, uh, that we're getting all the money and they're not getting any. One many at Spring Hill believed that Saturn's problem was being too successful. So successful that it threatened the leaderships of GM and the UAW. Skip LaFoe, the president of, of Saturn, uh, told me our problem was he, he never wanted to be more holier than the Pope. And the fact of the matter is that uh, we were so successful that we were actually an embarrassment to people back in, in Detroit. With that came the time clocks. We didn't have time clocks, if you remember. We was on a honesty. But now we've got the time clocks. We were hired as thinkers to br uh, bring innovative ideas before, and now we really don't have that anymore. You come in, you punch the clock, you get on the line, you do your job, you punch out, and you go home. And uh, for some of us, it's rather mundane and boring now for us. We came, we came to Saturn to get away from that kind of rat in a wheel thing for putting the widget on the widget. Something had to change, and either General Motors had to begin to look more like Saturn in order to be able to achieve that kind of performance, or Saturn had to go back and look more like General Motors. I think it was unstable to have this, uh, this innovative organization look so different than the parent company. If you want to spot a trend, all you need to do is look at where the money is going. For General Motors, $2.3 billion going to a new battery plant here in the United States. Now, it's not going to be built here in Metro Detroit. It's in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Business editor Rob Maloney shows us what it means, not just for the company, but for the industry as a whole. Does Chattanooga actually have the workforce to support the plan? Now, the president of Chattanooga State says this announcement will test the community's readiness. WDEF News Sultan Manny Williams joins us now with that part of the story on what part local institutions will play. Chattanooga State President Jim Catanzaro was at Eastgate this morning to celebrate the grand opening of an additional location, and that's when News 12 delivered the good news. Catanzaro says Chat State will play a major role in providing the workforce for this new plant. He says he vis Volkswagen visited the campus several weeks ago to assess their capabilities. Now he cites Chattanooga's mature workforce that's ready to go when the plant opens. The federal government spent most of its Cold War money on the defense and aerospace industries of the South, where everything was cheaper compared to the North. Workers could even be paid less, in part due to there being less labor unions in the South. The Sun Belt also received much more money than the North from the federal government in terms of military and aerospace spending. Oil boomed in Texas. Tourism obviously boomed pretty much everywhere in the Sun Belt. The creation of the Interstate Highway system in the 1950s opened up once isolated southern regions to the rest of the country. Southern governments offered incentives for businesses to move there. Part and free trade. You know, it was Reagan who put through NAFTA. I don't know if any of you know that. We could not get it passed uh, under Ronald Reagan. We just couldn't. Uh, the Republicans were probably the, primarily the problem at that time. But free trade is really, really really important. I mean, there's some things we make better than other pe than foreigners. And there's some things foreigners make better than we do. We and they would be foolish in the extreme. If we didn't sell them those products, we make better than they do. In exchange for those products, they make better than we do. The average hourly workers wages seem to be flat, at least going back to 1970. 
So workers uh, who uh, are paid hourly haven't seen a, any rise in their real uh, earnings uh, over a very long period of time, almost four decades now. By contrast, if you look at the data for output per worker, productivity, labor productivity growth, uh, what you see is it has been pretty robust, averaging around 2% a year. So there's this large gap between average hourly earnings deflated and uh, productivity per worker. Mm -hmm. And those two lines tracked each other. Every time labor productivity went up about 3%, wages went up about 3%. Right? And so by between the end of World War II and the mid-1970s, those two lines increased by almost exactly the same percentage point, about 100%. Each person was making 100% more per hour and was getting paid 100% more per hour. Since the mid-1970s, labor productivity has kept going up almost the same rate as it was before the mid-70s. So it's now at about 250% higher than in 1950. Wages stopped growing in mm -hmm. the mid-1970s. Mm -hmm. And so the average worker now is making about 100% more than they did in, in 1950, but they're producing about 250% more. Mm -hmm. Why aren't workers sharing in the prosperity that they've helped create? Well, that's exactly the problem. It used to be that when productivity went up, wages went up. Workers, you work harder, you got more of the results of it. You got the fair day's pay for the fair day's work, you got more results. You shared in the rise in worker productivity. Now almost all the rise in worker productivity is going not just to the upper class, but to the very top of the upper class. So well, what is the problem today? The problem today is that uh, inequality is at its highest that has been probably ever. And we have the greatest inequality in the developed world and the greatest in immobility of our society. And people don't understand in America the depth of the problem. It's about people, it's about society, it's about lack of jobs, lack of education. It's a problem where 60% of all American homes have to borrow money at the end of the first, at the end of each month. So General Motors Mexico cuenta con una de las plantas más impresionantes del mundo. Ubicada en el estado de Guanajuato, el complejo de Silao produce tres de las pickups más vendidas del mundo: Silverado, Cheyenne y Sierra. Often described as a race to the bottom on wages, Mexico may instead represent a triple threat. Workers willing to work not just harder, but yes, for less pay. A place open to global trade and one that is increasingly educated and highly skilled, and working hard to get even more so. I'm a factory worker. I'm proud of it. I thought I was going to retire from GM, and it didn't work out that way. We went to a meeting and seen on TV that they were shutting the plant down. I had this vision of this big, gentle dragon taking its last breath. I couldn't believe the reaction of the people. that so proud of our work. I know how much went into building that high-quality vehicle. It's the family. It's the people. It's your friends. And I love them all. We spend thousands and thousands of dollars fighting wars in other countries. Let's take care of our own people here. So bottom line, uh, we can't protect these entitlements and, and also have the national defense we need to protect us in a dangerous world while we're at war. Uh, the left primarily argues, well, no, Social Security isn't bankrupt. Look, bankrupt, Neil, as you well know, is when you can't pay your debts. You can get around it, I suppose, by paying people less than their do on Social Security by raising the retirement age. Those are all changes. It's like renegotiating with the bank when you can't pay your mortgage. But the bottom line is, once they've exhausted the trust fund, then all they have, as, uh, have, as Hadley said, is a, an aging population not supported by the number of workers out there. You have a bankrupt uh, Social Security and Medicare.
Ever since President Reagan presented his plan for rescuing the troubled Social Security system a month ago, people have been talking. The 23 million Americans now living in retirement say their benefits are being eaten up by inflation and they can't afford any cuts. Workers contemplating retirement are asking whether they can afford it. Young workers are asking if Social Security will be there when they retire. The administration says drastic action is needed now, but members of Congress are rebelling against parts of the president's plan. Today, Social Security funds disability benefits, old age medical care, and a variety of other benefits. The money received by individual beneficiaries has also increased steadily. In 1972, Congress tied benefits to inflation. Every time the cost of living went up, so did Social Security payments. And to pay for the increased benefits, we have had to pay higher Social Security taxes. Today we pay 6.65% of the first $29,700 in income to Social Security. Half of us now pay more in Social Security taxes than income tax. Social Security taxes are scheduled for another increase in 1984. But that still isn't enough to adequately fund Social Security. This year, the system will pay out more than $160 billion in benefits. Health and Human Services Secretary Richard Swiker says that rate of expenditure will mean trouble soon. And if nothing is done, the system will go broke as early as the fall of 1982. For nearly 11 million Americans, including more than 1 million veterans and almost 2 million children who rely on this program to get the nutrition that they need, to heat their homes, and to pay for their medicine. This is a program that impacts, quite honestly, uh, some of the very most vulnerable people in this country. And let me be very clear in describing this program that this is a program that American workers have paid into, have paid into. It is an insurance program. This is not charity. When Americans pay 6.2% of their income in the payroll tax, almost 1% of that amount goes into the disability insurance program. The average disability insurance benefit is less than $1,200 a month. And for 30% of beneficiaries, this is all of the income that they have. Nobody is getting rich off of disability benefits. Sadly, on the very first day of the new Congress, House Republicans passed a rule that would lay the groundwork, lay the groundwork for a 19% cut in Social Security disability insurance benefits. In Health News, a fiery discussion led by Connecticut Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro on the ongoing impact of cuts in the United Healthcare Medicare Advantage program. More than 2,000 doctors and healthcare facilities were just dropped from that list of providers caring for seniors right here in our state. Well, News 8's medical reporter Jocelyn Momenta has been following this story from the very beginning and has more tonight on what steps a congresswoman plans to take. These seniors did not hold back their frustration at this fact-finding discussion held by Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. No one can get an answer. They didn't give you any indication that anything like that was no. changing. If you have a traditional job making $50,000, you pay 6.2% of your salary or $3,100 a year in Social Security taxes. That number is then matched by your employer. Now, Social Security takes your top 35 earning years, adjusts them for inflation, adds them all together, then divides that number by 420, or the number of months in 35 years. That gives you $4,196. Still with me? That figure gives you your average indexed monthly earnings, or AIME. Simple. The system is heading for a train wreck. Ah, but you want a little nuance. A little nuance there. All right. Alan? It depends on what you mean by crisis. The problem gets worse every year. And if we don't deal with it now, uh, some people may be dead when we deal with it, but those who aren't dead will have a much heavier price to pay. Okay. The benefits currently are relatively modest in size. They're lower relative to earnings than they have been in the past and are scheduled under current law to go down, and they are very modest compared to the benefits paid in other developed nations. The trustees for Medicare and Social Security, of which I used to be one, say Medicare will run out of money by 2026, three years sooner than last projected, and Social Security will run out in 2034. 
But this doesn't have to be the case. Here are three easy fixes to Social Security and Medicare that Republicans don't want you to know about. First, raise the cap on income subject to Social Security payroll taxes. This year, that cap is $128,400, meaning that every dollar earned above $128,400 isn't subject to Social Security taxes. So the typical CEO of a big company who makes over $15 million pays Social Security taxes on just $128,400 of his or her income, a tiny fraction. While the typical nurse practitioner who takes home around $100,000 pays Social Security taxes on every dollar of his or her income. In this era of raging inequality, that's not fair. And it's not even logical. So the first fix is to raise the cap on income subject to Social Security taxes. Right now, you pay 12.4% of earnings up to a cap of $90,000. That is split between employee and employer, but no taxes are collected on any earnings over $90,000 per person. Now, the income cap on the payroll tax has risen slowly since 1982, indexed to average earnings. If earnings continue to rise, as in the past, the cap would rise. But not nearly enough to keep pace with projected Social Security benefits. Removing the cap entirely, thereby imposing a flat tax of 12.4% on all earnings, essentially a $100 billion a year tax increase on the wealthy, would more than completely close the funding gap. Even lifting the cap today to, say, 150000 by using a different index would solve more than half the problem. But such calculations beg the question, why was there a cap in the first place? Raising the income tax cap on Social Security seemed an obvious solution. There shouldn't be a cap on it. Everyone should pay. Up as high as long as you're making the money, you should have to pay on it. That makes a lot of sense. Yes, of course. But a CNN USA Today Gallup poll in February found that two-thirds of Americans supported applying a Social Security tax on all income. And at Columbia, Folks who will obviously be affected by a rise in the tax cap supported it almost as enthusiastically as those out on the street. How many people are in favor of at least raising the cap to 150? Well, I have no issue returning to something that looks like the system of taxation under Eisenhower or under, you know, presidents in the 60s and or 70s. And how 70. much would that be? I would like to... Well, it's somewhere between about 60% and 80% for people who make an incredible amount of money. So for the top 1%, okay. I would like to see them taxed at a much higher rate because they, they can afford to pay it. 60 to 80%, right off the top. Take it off you. Economist Brian Westbury is with us. What would a 60 to 80% tax rate do to the economy? <laughs> Stuart, it would be awful. You know the rise of inequality is a specific historical period. It starts in the late 1970s. It really uh, it reaches a peak around 2000. After Back in 1980, when I was running for president, it was all so different. 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 I'm going to find a way out of here. You can't.